are listening to the Bat Flip Podcast, a baseball podcast from Belly Up Sports and the Belly Up Podcast Network. Here are your hosts, Damian and Matt. Welcome back, everyone, to the Bat Flip Podcast. My name is Damian here with my co-host, Matt, coming to you on June 28th of 2022. Got a uh, shorter episode for you today. Got a big brawl that happened this week. A uh, couple injury news. Our first trade of the hot stove season. Uh, we're going to talk about MLB talking with the A's about their potential relocation. Uh, a prospect finally gets his call after being a number one overall pick, what, nine years ago? Um, and then we'll mention a bill today that the Senate has pushed against MLB. Plus players of the week. But before we get to all of that, how are you doing, Matt? Doing pretty good. Um, I had a, had a pretty nice week and uh, excited for the holiday next weekend. And uh, looking forward to talking a little baseball tonight. Yeah, I cannot wait for that that uh, holiday coming up for sure. July 4th is always fun to celebrate. Um, and then my birthday is just shortly after on that Friday. So it's going to be a... It's going to be a good week right there for sure. I'm going to probably take a three-day work week there and have two three-day weekends bookending it, so that'll be nice. But let's go ahead and we'll jump right in to uh, – we'll, we'll start with the brawl that happened between the Angels and Mariners on Sunday. Um, there was a hit by a pitch in Saturday's game. I forget who actually got hit um, from the Angels. Just – Oh, I, I was gonna say it was Jesse Winker, but no, but you said that from yeah. the Angels, yeah. I don't yeah, know. it was the, it was the day before. Uh, there was a hit by pitch that the Mariners hit one of the Angels players. I forget exactly who it was, and then like on Sunday they had announced their starter was gonna be Jose Suarez. A cut, like I think they said it was like thirty minutes or forty minutes before the game, they switched to a bullpen guy, saying that the starter was, you know, gonna be scratched today for soreness or or something like that. He hits Julio Rodriguez or throws behind Julio Rodriguez in the first and then hits Jesse Winker in the second. And I don't know who said something from the Angels dugout, but it caused this massive brawl that broke out. Um, Anthony Rendon's out there with a the cast punching Jesse Winker in the face. I mean, coaches are throwing stuff. Rice and Glacius grabs sunflower seeds and chucks them across the field. It was just a massive, massive brawl. Um, ended up that 12 players actually got suspended in the incident and even some other front office type player personnel people from both teams as well got suspended. Yeah, so to go back, I just looked up the first the the first uh, catalyst for that was Eric Swanson threw a 95 mile per hour fastball that ran up and in on Trout there you go. near his head. So obviously, don't throw it, Mike Trout, or you're going to get in trouble. But um, but yeah, I mean, this was just a wild brawl, uh, one of the wilder ones we've seen in a while. Uh, both teams were were obviously furious. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously you hate seeing that, but at the same time, it's kind of good to see because, you know, I think some of that type of, you know, that, those rivalries and stuff that that's really good for baseball. Um, obviously having a full on brawl like that's probably not great for baseball, but, um, uh, obviously, and obviously I think it's bad for the game if that's based off of a, um, based off of a, like a bat flip or something, but, you know, protecting your players, protecting your superstar, uh, I don't want to see people get intentionally hit, but, you know, I think sometimes the rivalries and stuff can be good. And, uh, man, that's a long list of suspensions we got. Yeah, so it starts with uh, manager Phil Nevin of the Angels getting 10 games. Jesse Winker got seven games. Uh, J.P. Crawford, Anthony Rendon, and Dom, I don't, I don't, it's going to sound weird, Ch- Chitty, got five games. Yeah. Um, Andrew Waints, who was the, the bullpen arm that started the game, and Ryan Tapera got three games. Julio Rodriguez, Rysel Iglesias, Ray Montgomery, and Manny Del Campo got two games. And then Bill Hasselman got one game. A um, couple things with as I, as I mentioned, the starter got scratched. As soon as uh, Wance was thrown out of the game, the original starter came in the game that got scratched for soreness. He came in and pitched after. So that wasn't more of a sign. But uh, with Rendon being on the IL, it is interesting that he'll have to serve those games next year when he's able to come off the IL, but MLB did actually still suspend him from being on the bench for five games, regardless of the five game suspension he's going to have to serve next year whenever he's ready to actually come off the IL. Yeah, that's kind of weird. I don't, I don't especially understand that. I mean, you know, if you're going to suspend him, suspend him, you know, for fully for five games now or, you know, whenever he's healthy, I, I wouldn't. I don't understand suspending him for five, 
not you can't be in the ballpark games and then five you're actually suspended games that's kind of weird but um but yeah i mean that's a big you know big deal i mean losing julio rodriguez for a couple games is big um you know obviously the angels now are gonna have to scramble for a a backup to the backup manager uh since you know obviously phil nevin's already a an interim and now they're gonna have to go find another guy to to manage them for 10 games which is a pretty extended period of time so uh that'll be interesting to see and um yeah i mean it's it, just that's just wild stuff i mean uh rendome coming out with a cast on is yeah. yeah i mean that's that's pretty crazy and then um you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I get why they're coming down hard on on Phil Nevin because it was quite obvious that he was the one who orchestrated, you know, being coming out there doing that cause since he with the way he managed the pitchers and you know scratching the starter and stuff for that. So uh, definitely, um, you know, that's not you know that's not something you typically see from a manager. Usually, it's you know they're going to throw their guy and if he throws at him, he throws at him and gets thrown out of the game and then you end up with a bullpen game at that point. You know, it's not. It's not usually a we're going to throw a guy for an inning just so he can hit somebody and then bring in our starter. Like, that's that's unusual. So, uh, but definitely, um, you know, definitely interesting. And uh, those teams play a lot of games against each other. So, I don't know if it's over now or, or I'm sure the next couple games will be on the, under the microscope. But uh, I don't know if it's over or not. Those, that's, a, that's a pretty big rivalry. Those teams play a lot, a lot of games coming up. So, uh, we'll see if anything else uh, transpires from that. Yeah, and then you mentioned with Phil Nevin, you know, it's going to be a big loss for the Angels. But Jesse Winker for seven games for the Mariners, yep. who has been really hot. I mean, this past week, Winker was hitting four twenty nine with a five eighty six uh, on base percentage and eight ten slugging. You know, a couple homers. He was starting to look like Jesse Winker of old. And then J.P. Crawford for five games as well. I mean, that's another guy who's had a really good season for, for them so far. And is there, they're still trying to battle, you know trying to get back up to uh, wild card contention after they've kind of fell out of it. But those are going to be big losses for them. Um, Another big loss for them is going to be Ty France. Uh, He ended up having a collision at first base the other day and on ended up getting a grade two flexor strain in his left arm, which is his catching arm. Um, They aren't quite sure the timeline he's pushing to come back as soon as he's eligible, but you never know with those flexor strains and how that's going to go long term. Um, and while that happened, they ended up trading for first baseman Carlos Santana uh, from the Royals for a pros- two prospects named Wyatt Mills and William Fleming. Yeah, so you know, starting off Ty France, that, that's a big time bummer uh, to lose him. He was absolutely killing it. Um, you know, already put up 2.3 WAR on the season, a 156 WRC plus. You're not going to replace that, but uh, you know, from from the point of view of the Mariners, you know, going out and getting. Uh, Going out and getting uh, uh, Carlos Santana, it, it makes sense. Um, I was actually intrigued the other day. Apparently, Carlos Santana caught the other day, which is kind of crazy. Uh, we haven't seen that. He did. He did catch the other day. They had, I think, uh, Melendez was DHing and Perez was out because of the injury. Huh. So they had Carlos Santana caught. He didn't catch the whole game, I don't think, but he caught some. And uh, that was interesting because that's been a long time, I think, since he's caught. But, oh, uh, you know, it, it, yeah. So, but Carlos Santana, you're getting a, a guy who he's still a – he's an okay bat. He's about a league average-ish bat. Um, you know, he's got a really low bat, batting average on balls in play, but he's not going to run a very high batting average on balls in play. So his his line on the season, 216, 349 on base, 341 slugging. You know, obviously you'd like to see him slug a little bit better, but – uh, you know, he's a guy that's going to get on base at a pretty pretty good clip. He always has. And, you know, a 17% walk rate is really nice to see. Um, and, I mean, he can kind of play first base still. He's not going to he's not gonna catch. Uh, <laughs> for the, I, uh, just looking, I don't even – Fangraphs doesn't have him catching in the inning so far this year. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, he was listed as on, on the box score as having caught. I, I don't know if he actually caught, but he was listed. I was looking through the box scores, and he was listed as uh, – as a catcher on the, in that game. So maybe they just, maybe they listed him there and something happened or I don't know. It might've been wrong, but it was in the box score the other day that I was looking at. Um, but anyways, but yeah, Carlos oh, Santana, no, I see what you're looking at. It was yeah. Melendez was DH and he went to catcher, but that's because Gallagher was catching, but Santana, they list him as C Santana. Uh, so it looks like it was, it looks like it was catcher first base, but it was just his gotcha. name. 
Gotcha. Well, that, my bad then. But um, he didn't catch then. But he used to be a catcher. But um, but yeah, got going forward. Um, you know, losing him is a big deal. Um, or getting getting him's pretty pretty helpful to the Mariners. You know, while France is out. Um, and then for the Royals, it, it makes a lot of sense because Vinny Pascantano is a guy who in you know, in the minor leagues has hit and hit and hit some more. He is a horrible defensive player, uh, uh, horrible speed wise. And, but I mean, he can flat out hit and apparently he's, uh, he's above average defensively. Um, so, you know, you look at him in the minor leagues this year, had a 280 average, 372 on base and a 576 slugging, uh, really nice stats there. Uh, 18 home runs in, only uh, 69 games, nice. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think he's going to be a really solid big leaguer. Um, you know, those numbers should translate pretty well to the big leagues. Um, you know, like I say, that 20-grade speed he's got, it's going to limit him to only first base. But, um, you know, that hit tool is great. And, and then the fact that he, he does have some, some decent power is going to help as well. So, you know, we'll see what happens with um, – you know, we'll see what happens with uh with, with him at the big league level, and then and then the two players that came back from the trade, uh, you know, were a couple of you know one of them was a reliever who had been a, a fairly fairly good rated prospect for for uh, Seattle, but had struggled, you know, at the big league level, and also um, you know you look at a guy in um you know the the other one I think Fleming, um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, he was he's kind of a back end of the top 30 type prospect that, you know, is probably a, a future reliever. So you get a couple guys with, you know, you might end up getting to pitch in the big leagues for, you know, Carlos Santana, who has no future in, in Kansas City other than just he was blocking Pasquantano. So uh, definitely a good trade for Kansas City. Yeah, and they still even have Nick Prado um, yeah. as another first base prospect that could come up as well. Maybe not right now, but um, in the future, you know, Mills, he. He was pretty decent in the majors this year. 4.15 ERA, but a 3.48 FIP. Um, the expected expected FIP was still high at a five, but I mean, he's been pretty decent. I mean, for a Royals team, he'll be just fine. I mean, for a team that's kind of rebuilding and setting themselves up for the future, like you said, Fleming's going to be a back end, either you know, depth starter or just a long reliever, kind of out of the bullpen type guy. But yeah. Santana didn't have a future there, and you get to bring one of your top prospects up in the uh, the royal system and see what you got and the mariners get a, a you know a guy who can fill in for france for now and then be a solid bench bat for you late i mean he, in june he was crushing so far yeah. i don't have his stats right in front of me but i think it was like 357 so far in june he was batting um so you know you get a guy while he's hot and maybe he helps make up for some of that lack of offense you have right now yep but uh, so we'll jump on to our next one, which is another bit of injury news, and that's with Bryce Harper. Uh, he ended up getting hit with a 97-mile-an-hour fastball on the thumb, ended up causing a thumb fracture. He's actually going to undergo surgery tomorrow, and they're looking at about a six- to eight-week timeline until he's able to get back to you know to baseball activities. Yeah, I mean, that's a bummer for Bryce Harper. He was having a great year, um, was knocking the cover off the ball, uh, you know, he had already dealt with the elbow injury, uh, pu- pushing him to DH only duties. And, you know, even then he was still very valuable for the Phillies, even not being able to play defense. And, you know, it's a bummer for him uh, and, and the Phillies because they couldn't afford to lose this bat, especially they had been really hot this month. Um, you know, and, and losing him is, is, a, is a really, really, really big hurt for the Phillies because, um, you know, that takes uh, their best bat, bat out of their lineup and, um, you know, that that's not a team that can afford, you know, a lot of room for error right now with, you know, being around the being behind the Braves and Mets already being on the very edge of playoff contention. And the fact that, I mean, their playoff odds were already, you know, in the in the, you know, their playoff odds are in the low 30s right now. And, you know, with a with a long period of no Bryce Harper, that that, that is not probably gonna gonna do too well so um you know maybe he'll come back soon hopefully you know six to eight weeks so you're looking at what the end of august yeah um you know if they're still in it august yeah i mean if they're still in it at then you know at the end of august and he comes back i mean you would assume six to eight weeks and he'd have to have a re you know at least three or four games of rehab too um you know and and that's just like you said that's just baseball activities 
So, mm-hmm. you know, looking at the end of August, I mean, you would hope that he would be able to come back and, and play around them. But, you know, I don't know if the Phillies are going to still be in the race. I mean, they're already like, what, ten, eight, nine games behind the behind the Mets. So, Something, um, something like that. And, and obviously the division was going to be tough regardless. But, you know, the wild card, they're three or four games out of the wild card right now. And I don't think that the Braves are going to, fall apart and I don't think that the Giants are going to fall apart who are around the Phillies and I mean one of those I mean I think the 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 Cardinals and Brewers are both going to stay with pretty good records and obviously the Padres and Dodgers are going to have great records so uh, you know that that extra wild card you know even with that extra wild card it's gonna be tough for the Phillies to, to make the postseason without Bryce Harper yeah and I I wonder that if they are out you know, when he's around the timeline of coming back, if it wouldn't even make sense to shut him down and say, maybe even say, Hey, go get the UCL surgery right now. And maybe you miss the first month of the season or so, you know, cause usually with a position player, it's six to seven months. You can get back to, you know, start throwing at least, but I mean, you know, as an outfielder, that will obviously be a little bit longer, but I just, I would think if you're out of it at that point, you're going to have to you know, just say get that dealt with because it's going to be an issue long term. I mean, we're, we've seen Max Muncy still struggle with it this year, um, and he tried to rehab through the offseason, and that's not even his throwing his throwing arm. It's his non-throwing arm. Yeah. He so, might – I mean, Bryce Harper might – I mean, I would go ahead and do it now. I mean, he'd be back for the beginning of the year if he did it now, most likely, or close to the beginning of the year. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess erring on the side of caution, like, you know, if, if Dombrowski is able to make some moves at the deadline and make them a contender and they're, you know, contending for a wild card spot in the end of September, you get a guy like Bryce Harper back, like, that's a big boost to it. So I could understand from that scenario. But, like, if you get to the middle of, you know, the beginning to middle of August and it's not looking good, like, you guys are already there, like, I think at that point you decide to do it yeah. um, from that point. but. Either way, he's going to be out for the foreseeable future, and it, it sucks for a guy like Bryce Harper who's having such a great year. Um, yeah. You know, already battling the the elbow injury, injury, and then now you know the thumb fracture. But uh, we'll go jump over to our next kind of injury slash IL situation, and that was with Kenley Jansen. Um, actually, today had to go on the IL with an irregular heartbeat. He's dealt with this before. Back in 2012, he had an issue. Uh, shut him down for a while. He ended up having surgery. I believe he was in the off season to help with that. Uh, he dealt with it once again in 2018. He was shut down for about two to three weeks. Um, and then in the off season ended up having to have another surgery to help rep, um, you know, fix that issue again. So it doesn't sound like it's been, you know, a serious enough issue. It sounds like a 2018 where he could be only off for a week, a couple weeks or so. Um, but hopefully it does not turn into a, a, a big issue for Kenley Jansen because the Braves are going to need, a guy like that at the back end of their bullpen. Yeah, Kenley Jansen's looked really, really good this year so far. And, um, you know, it's actually been one of his better years since 2017 when he put up that insane year with the Dodgers. But, uh, you know, it, it's a bummer to see him get, get have this issue pop back up again. Uh, you know, the good news is that this is something he's dealt with before, and he's he's seemed to, when he's dealt with it, it just, you know, be able to rest him a couple weeks, and then he's back to being able to, you know, be – fully ready to go again uh you know they have pitched him on back-to-backs a couple times recently i don't know if over overworking him maybe a little bit uh you know might have affected it a little bit because i mean this he pitched back-to-back day saturday and sunday uh this weekend and then the issue pops up or coming or the issues put on the il today so i'm sure it came up after last night's start or uh you know attempt to close and um i think um you know, the Braves' injuries are piling up. I mean, especially in that bullpen. You know, Jansen's out. Matzik's been out for a while. Uh, he's starting to rehab. But, you know, you also got, you know, Ozzy Albies and Eddie Rosario out in that lineup. Uh, Ronald Acuna Jr.'s not playing tonight. He didn't play yesterday. Um, you know, he's not going on the IL, but he's got a bruised foot. He's missing a few games. Um, you know, Kirby Yates is still not back yet. So the Braves do have some injury issues right now. And, um, you know, they're hoping to hoping to get some of these guys back, you know, in the next few weeks. And that'll be very helpful to to the program for the Braves. But um, but yeah, I mean, Kenley Jansen being out, that's that's a big that's a big deal. So, yeah, at least they do still have a guy like Will Smith um, that does have some closing experience that can jump right in there. Um, yeah, I think 
Yeah, so say, right. I think Mentor's, Mentor's going to be closing for him because Will Smith struggled some this year. And in fact, that uh, the game, you know, the game right now is in the ninth inning. They just brought uh, Mentor in in the safe situation. So, um, well, there it is. Yeah. So, but Mentor's been insanely good this year. So hopefully he can continue that. But yeah, he has been. <laughs> Uh, so let's jump over and we're going to talk a little bit of a guy who got drafted back in 2013 as the number one overall pick um, in the draft, was supposed to have a bright future, really struggled um, in the minors. I think even at one time retired for a little bit, uh, came back, is now a reliever with the Phillies, and finally at the age of 30, now got his first call up to the major leagues with the Phillies. That is Mark Appel. Yeah, this is a pretty good story. Um, you've got, um, you know, uh, he's a guy that first overall pick, all these expectations on him out of, out of Stanford, um, you know, a right-handed pitcher, uh, came up with, with Houston, and, you know, he never really got going in his career. He His first couple of minor league seasons, he, he did okay at times, you know, moving him up. They moved him up a couple of times, he struggled, but then he adjusted. Uh, 2014, you know, looked pretty good in 39 innings at, um, you know, at, at double A. Um, and then, but after that, I mean, he just never really got a foothold, um, you know, 426 ERA 2015, uh, he got traded to Philly. Um, I don't remember what trade that was. It might've been I'm trying to remember what trade Houston made with Philly that year, but, um, but yeah, but it was um uh, oh it, it might have been Ken Giles actually. Um I think that is right. Yeah, I think it was the Ken Giles trade. I remember him getting moved cuz it was a fairly high profile trade, but uh but he just he just never really took off and, and then he didn't pitch in the minors between 2017 and 2021. Um so you know, that was the time you're talking about he was out of baseball for part of that time. I think he, you know, obviously he also had the COVID year in 2020. He didn't pitch regardless of whether he wanted to or not. And then uh, you know, he had been he, last year. He was really, really bad in the minors, double A AA and triple A as a starter. This year, he's been a full time reliever. He's been a little bit better. So, uh, you know, they figured, you know, why not give him a shot? He had a 161 ERA at triple A. His, his peripherals weren't that good, but they were they were improved over the all of his peripherals in his previous several seasons. So they, they thought they ought, ought to give him a shot. And he has still he still hadn't pitched yet in the big leagues, but um you know, he's on the team, so hopefully we get to see him make his long-awaited debut soon. But I did look up uh, before our show tonight. There's some interesting things about him. Um, you know, when he was picked in 2013, first overall, some of the players he was picked in front of uh, who were first-rounders, there was a lot of guys obviously picked in every draft that ended up being surprises. But other first-rounders, Chris Bryant was the number two pick. John Gray was picked to number three. Uh, you've got uh, Austin Meadows picked in the top ten. Uh, Dominic Smith picked number 11. Hunter Renfro was picked up high. J.P. Crawford, Tim Anderson were picked in the first round. Uh, you know, uh, the list goes on. And Aaron Judge was the 32nd pick. Uh, and then there's obviously tons of other guys who were picked later in that draft. But I thought it was really interesting, the guys that he was picked ahead of and, you know, didn't, I just didn't make it. So, um, you know, especially as a, as a college guy that gets picked number one, too. But uh, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, it, it's really nice to see Appel that has stuck with it finally get that call like you said hopefully we get to see him um actually get into a game because i think it was called up what saturday and yeah he hasn't been in a game yet and it doesn't look like he's gonna be in tonight's game um but another interesting thing i found is that i didn't i didn't even realize it until looking just a little bit ago that the week that Appel was traded was also the same week that dansby swanson was traded making it the first time that two number one overall picks had been traded in the same week um, was that was that offseason uh, yeah, where, where they got Shelby, the Shelby Miller for Dansby Swanson trade. So I thought yeah. that was pretty interesting as well. Yeah, that is interesting. I, I didn't even realize that. And, uh, one other little note here on, the, um, on, on that pick. You know, the Astros don't miss very often in the first round. Um, and, you know, that was one that they missed. You know, there are other first round picks around that time. You know, in uh, 20, 2010 was Mike fulton who was a big league all-star. Uh, 2011 was George Springer. 2012 was Carlos Correa. 2013, obviously, Mark Appel. 2014 was Brady Aiken, but they did not sign him. So they had two top five picks in 2015, with which they took Kyle Tucker and Alex Bregman. 
So around that time, the picks, the first round picks they had were Tucker, Bragman, Correa, Springer, and Fulton Evich, four of which were part of their World Series core. And then the other one of which was, you know, ended up being an all star after a trade to a different team. So, um, you know, Mark Appel was really the only miss that they had in that time frame. And, uh, you know, their 2016 first rounder was Forrest Whitley, who has been a top prospect, but, but has dealt with major injury issues. So definitely thought that was kind of interesting to look at, too. So just don't let the Astros draft first round pitchers and they should be fine. Yeah, that's right. That's what it sounds like. Uh, but no, it is good to see Opel and hopefully he gets that call up and, and you know, the, the, all those drafts around it's, you just never know what these prospects sometimes in baseball, yeah. like they, they are so hit and miss, even with the guy who is a, a surefire number one overall pick. You just never know. Absolutely. But let's jump over to our next thing with the MLB. Um, I don't know if they meant to leak it out or it got leaked out somehow. The Oakland A's have been battling for a new stadium deal um, with, I think it's Hudson County or something, some county up there with Oakland, San Francisco area about getting a new stadium. They've had multiple p- proposals declined, um, and there's going to be actually be a vote uh, on Thursday this week about their latest proposal. And Oakland, or the A's at least, have has already been talking to MLB and looking at potential relocation rumors. Um, and MLB basically has told the A's that, hey, there's usually a relocation fee, and it's going to be close to a billion dollars now. If Oakland denies your latest proposal, we will waive that billion dollar relocation fee if you move to Las Vegas. So basically, MLB is setting up that they want to get a team to Las Vegas. Um, and this is the easiest way is getting the A's to move there with no relocation fee. That's big for the A's who are a penny-pinching franchise anyways. Not having to pay some high-dollar um, relocation fee will be massive for them. But it also sets up the move like we now we pretty much know that Las Vegas is going to get a team, either if it's the A's relocating or in the next few years when we're looking at a potential two-team relo- or uh, two-team expansion through MLB, it's almost a surefire doubt that one of those will be in Las Vegas. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a few things that are interesting here, um, you know, uh, the A's, I, I want them to stay in Oakland just because they're the Oakland A's and they've been there for 50 years, 60 years, but same time, I mean, Oakland's market's just not that big anymore, especially with the giants taking such a share of the Bay area. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I just, I just don't think that, I don't think Oakland does a very good job supporting any franchises. I mean, they lost the Raiders. Their attendance is horrible. I know that part of that also is the team being bad and the stadium's bad and whatever, but, um, you know, I just don't know. I mean, it's not like they're supporting their other teams very well. I mean, you saw the, the Warriors move recently, uh, out of, you know, out of Oakland. And, um, I mean, it just, it just seems like they're, they're just not great support for, for teams, uh, and they need to add, uh, you know, they need to, 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 they need to support their franchise better, uh, whether it's, you know, obviously the ownership does too, but, um, but that's definitely something that needs to happen if they stay in Oakland. But, uh, you know, Las Vegas would be a great market for a new team. It's kind of a natural move from Oakland to Las Vegas. The Raiders just did it. Um, you know, Las Vegas doesn't have a, a team. One thing that I thought was found really interesting about Las Vegas is that, you know, obviously there's the minor league team there right now. Uh, I think their name's the Aviators now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, but they um, they actually uh, Las Vegas is at 2,000 feet of elevation, which is interesting. It's not quite. It's not Coors Field, you know, 5,000 feet, but it's also a pretty good bit higher. I think Phoenix is uh, the second highest elevation in the big leagues. I believe it is at. Um, I think it's at about 600 feet, maybe. So. Um, you know, I thought that was really interesting that, you know, you might end up seeing a, a miniature course effect at, in Las Vegas, with the elevation. And obviously they'd have to build some kind of retractable roof stadium, too, because of the heat. And during the summertime in Las Vegas being, you know, in the desert, it gets over 100 degrees regularly. So uh, definitely interesting thing to look at. Um, you know, Phoenix is actually at a thousand feet. So, uh, by the way, I see that now. But um but yeah, definitely something interesting to look at there. And then, you know, obviously Major League Baseball would like to expand, even if the even if the uh, the A's stay in um, 
you know, in Oakland, I think they would probably, I think 32 teams would be pretty, a pretty natural expansion. You could even take that new, the new 12 team playoffs and go to a similar format to what the NFL has had over the past with their 32 teams before this year. So, um, you know, that would be an interesting thing too. I don't know what our second site would be. I mean, there's obviously been a lot of talk about Montreal. There's been talk about Nashville at times. Um, there's been talk in the past about Portland, um, so I, th- I think that would be an interesting thing to look at too. Maybe we discuss that at some point in the future of potential expansion spots. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, this this is an interesting move, and you know, the A's. Uh, you know, I think either way, it'd be good good for baseball. It'd be good if the A's get a new stadium and get better support in Oakland, or if they go to Las Vegas, it's tapping into a new market that's been untapped. And uh, I think that uh, Las Vegas has supported their new sports franchises extremely well. So. Yeah, Las Vegas absolutely makes sense either way if it's for the A's or for, you know, a, a potential expansion. I, I don't want the Oakland to leave either. Like, it, it's just been the Oakland A's forever. Like, that's how it should be. Um, they just need to realize, like, hey, we should support them better, like you were mentioning. You you already saw the Raiders move and the success they've already had there. Like, why would you want your other team to go do the exact same thing? Yeah. Like, doesn't it doesn't make sense there. Um, you know, I, I and it, as far as the second place, I think it's either Montreal or Nashville. For me, at least, I, I just think those are the two that make the most sense. Um, but we can talk about that in a later episode um, when, when expansion gets a lot closer. But it is interesting. Um, you know, it seems like MLB is really pushing for that. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that they put that out on the same week and just a couple days before this vote, this very crucial vote is supposed to happen. It's a uh, it's very convenient timing, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's good for the A's because you either get a new stadium or you get to go to a place that'll build you build you a new stadium there and in, in a better market. So exactly. So let's jump over to our last piece of news, um, and we're just going to briefly touch on it. We'll talk a lot more about it as it expands because it's a very interesting story. But today, the Senate, um, at least four people on the Senate, um, I believe, where is it at? I have it right here. Um, four, yeah, four senators, Dick Durbin, uh, Chuck Grassy, senators, uh, Richard Luthmel and Mike Lee signed a, uh, a letter today targeting MLB's antitrust exemption. Man, can I speak? Um, and basically the letter is seeking information and kind of targeting the international work stop or the work stoppages that we've had the past couple of years, the minor league uh, contraction and lack of pay for minor league players, the, and uh, the, the shady dynamics around the international free agent market. We've heard about a lot of the corruption and people wanting the international draft, which we've talked about here with throughout, throughout the uh, CBA negotiations. But, They've had this exemption for over a hundred years. I think it was just last month, a hundred year anniversary came up um, of them getting this antitrust, um, you know, exemption. Part of that had kind of went away in 1998 with the Kurt Floyd Act, but it's a very developing story here. We're not quite sure what it's actually going to lead all into, um, and it's going to develop as you know time goes on, and we'll figure out more about it. But it is pretty interesting. You know, there's been a lot of rumors about the work stoppages you know how mlb was manipulating that through the players were saying that we've seen the you know the minor leagues make a big push the last couple years through even through the cba for getting livable wages and housing um you know and then we've heard a lot about the corruption throughout the international system so i think it's going to be very interesting to see where this you know bill and, and letter kind of takes the future of the mlb yeah, I definitely uh, think it's interesting. Um, you know, I don't like – I get real frustrated when Congress gets involved in sports because I don't think it's, you know, any of their business what's going on in sports most of the time. Uh, you know, but I think – and I think sometimes they push things to where it makes it – they push things to a point to where it harms the sport. Kind of like, you know, with college sports, with the NIL stuff – you know, I think that that's something that needed to eventually happen, but you know, the way they pushed it made it completely, un, you know, completely undoable for long term, and you know, it just makes it really, really tough. But um, I think that um, you know, obviously, if you look at you know, at this, this is probably not a good situation for MLB. I'm sure that eventually some compromise will come to where the MLB will give in to some level, 
you know, to what whatever Congress wants them to do. Uh, and, and but I think at the end of the day, I mean, I think it's good that some lights being shined on the, the issues with the minor leagues because, uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the issues, it, it makes it really difficult. And, and I don't understand from a team standpoint. I mean, you know, it would help your team and your franchise an awful lot if a players wanted to be there in the minor leagues because they're getting paid well and they're happy and you know also the fact that it makes it makes it really difficult for players to succeed and to improve to, to be you know underpaid and, and just in poor conditions in the minor leagues I mean you know stuff like nutrition and you know and health in general I mean you know you have players get you know with really, really poor nutrition at times in the minor leagues and you know that does not help you as a franchise to have your players get out of shape I mean it's just, just not good uh, you know that kind of thing and and I think that um you know, maybe maybe something good will come out of this, but uh, definitely something to monitor going forward. But um, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. So just another thing, a little thing that came up on this weekend is kind of um, it was started with the whole Wes Johnson thing, which we didn't even mention. The Minnesota yep. Twins pitching coach um, has accepted a job offer from LSU in the middle of the season and is leaving the team. I th- believe on Friday. I want to say he's staying with the team through this this uh, series against the. Uh, guardians but then he's leaving to start recruiting at lsu but through watching a bunch of different stuff about that and and how the whole situation happened you know nil has changed that and people were making the argument that like hey even a player from high school that gets drafted right now even say you're not like the first round pick and you're not getting the high signing bonus or whatever why wouldn't you go to college through nil now if you're getting a hundred thousand dollars go get say 70 75,000 through NIL go be in a D1 school with D1 facilities, you know, great fields, you know, you're going to have everything around you that you need and it's going to be probably a lot better conditions than the minor leagues are in and you're getting paid just slightly less there. Like I, I think that is a big issue and in, I think now with NIL you could see a lot more players opting to either go back to school or, you know, from high school foregoing their you know, direct the draft and whoever team signed them to just go to college. Um, you know, we've seen NIL explode in college football. So I would be interested to see how it starts affecting the, you know, MLB level draft now or minor league level draft, whatever you want to say. Um, and how that actually starts affecting things moving forward. With, will prospects just decide to go back until you get a bigger one, a bigger signing bonus or whatever? Yeah, that that's a hundred percent. Um, hundred percent true i think it's going to affect the ability to bring pull college players out of you know or pull high school players in the draft uh that's already something that's been picking up has been guys going to college because um you know college baseball is getting bigger so every year yeah. and um you know and it's a lot of fun to watch and, and you know it's there's a lot more eyes on the college world series than on the low a championships I mean, absolutely there is <laughs> so, um it's it's a lot more fun and you get that experience and you know you're not getting paid quite as much but you know if you make the right if you make that choice i mean even as a first rounder back into the first rounder type guy i mean obviously if you're like you know this year's class like tamara johnson jackson holiday all these guys right they're gonna go pro because they're gonna get multi-millions coming out of high school but if you're in that you know second round ish category and you're looking at a choice of either 800,000 or go to college. I mean, a lot of those players end up getting picked in the first round in three years and making that five, two, three million dollars. So, you know, that's a, a lot of times it's a good investment to start with money wise. Plus the fact that you're in college and having fun and, you know, able to do that, have that experience. Plus, you know, possibly advance your, you know, make it a good monetary investment <laughs> doing that. And now even with NIL on top of that, all that, you know, that I think it's a big deal and it's going to help. Uh, that's going to help college baseball and it hurts major league baseball, but maybe, you know, major league baseball probably will have a way to counteract that. And hopefully it's a way that, that, that competition drives up, you know, the ability to, to pay minor leaguers better and, and to give them better conditions. So. Yeah, I don't even think it hurts major leaguers, like major league teams. Like, I just think it hurts the minor leagues to it. Like, the major league teams make well enough money. They're going to have players in the system all the time that they're going to be able to pull up anyways. It's just going to hurt the overall prospect depth that you're able to recoup each year through the draft. Um, You know, 
but it is pretty interesting and i'm going to be excited to see what it looks like moving forward because we've seen that shift kind of start happening but i think now it's going to take even another step forward um, as nil has grown bigger as we've seen over the last year or two but anyways that'll wrap up the main portion of the show so now we'll jump over to players of the week to wrap it up so who do you have for your hitter this week so my hitter this week actually had one of his games was one of the bigger games of the year um but it's isaac paradez he had a he had a three homer game but um he actually uh he's he's been fantastic this week uh he's only played in four games uh for the rays but in those four games he's hit 667 with a 706 on base a 1800 slugging percentage yeah. and he's hit five home runs in 17 plate appearances so obviously isaac paradez has been on fire he had a couple walk-off hits i mean he's just been absolutely insane this week and this is a guy that he's got a pretty interesting career so far um you know he started off uh, with the with the cubs and he actually got traded in the justin wilson trade which is a horrible trade for the cubs right now they traded uh, him and Jamar Candelario, who's been a pretty solid player throughout his career so far for, for Detroit, even though he's not having a great year this year. Um, he, he, you know, they traded those two for, for Justin Wilson, who was a mediocre reliever, and Alex Avila, who was there for half a season as a backup catcher behind Wilson Contreras. So, you know, that was a horrible trade for the Cubs. And, uh, you know, now Paredes got traded for Austin Meadows, which looks like a good trade for the Rays. Don't trade for the don't trade with the Rays. But uh, <laughs> he's a guy who's put up a lot of really good numbers in the minor leagues. Uh, a great plate discipline guy, a lot high walk rate, not a high strikeout rate. Um, he needs a little bit better of a de- more of a defensive home, uh, it seems like. But, you know, defensively this year by outs above average, he's actually been pretty good. So, uh, you know, if he plays defense at the level he's playing right now and he hits well he's hit he's got a 164 wrc plus with a 203 batting average on balls in play so if that batting average on balls in play comes up a little bit which i'm sure it'll come up over 203 um he could he could you know he could be a really nice player for the Rays. so uh good to see him having a you know really his breakout week this week yeah it was it was pretty fun watching for so i saw some of that three homer game um and then i believe i was watching it was the next day i was watching the game um it was, i think it was one of the early ones um and I had it on, and I think he was batting second or third or whatever, and came up and homered in that at bat too. And they had said like that is basically four homers in like five at bats because I think he technically had a walk in there as well. Um, so it was whatever he had like four homers in like five at bats though. So it was pretty interesting. Um, and he's just been tearing the cover off the ball all the way around. Um, you know, not a guy that was a high level prospect, but that's come up with the Rays. You mentioned don't trade to the Rays. They just find a way to make guys like this you know be good it's it's their mo for all of eternity of how they you know take take players to the next level you trade a guy like austin meadows who wasn't quite doing what you wanted to had a a good couple years with you but you trade him away get a guy come in and then now he's kind of reached that next level as well so it'll be interesting to see how he looks going forward because uh it was he had some fun at bats this week for sure oh yeah no doubt But for my hitter this week, I ended up going with a guy who's a little lower down the list of impact, but overall the, uh, the week he had and the way he's kind of turned around his season so far, and that's Adley Rutschman, um, you know, on the week, a 348 average 375 on base and 826 slugging still a 235 or WRC plus on the week. Uh, but a guy who, you know, we mentioned he was still playing great defense, just wasn't quite hitting. He had a couple homers this week. I think he even hit one last night. He's hit some big doubles. Um, I believe he had a go-ahead RBI double um, against the White Sox over the weekend. So a guy who's really starting to reach that next level um, offensively that you know than he was and kind of starting to fulfill that prospect status that we all kind of put on him. And I think through 30 games this year, he's, basic, he's at .9 war, so almost a full war already through 30 games for a guy who's batting 234 with a 298 on base so far this season. Yeah, that's a, that's some really impressive stuff for him. Um, he, um, he's starting to really figure it out and hit well. He had some bad luck on his, on his batting batted balls early on, uh, but he was striking out a little bit more than you would think Adley would strike out, but he's going to be a fantastic player. Um, and he's already that the Orioles are playing pretty well right now. I mean, he's he's playing well. Um, you know, some of their pitchers have actually pitched pretty well this year so far. 
Um, you know, they've got uh, they've got some pieces in that lineup, like like you know Santander, uh, you know Mancini, Austin Hayes is having a breakout year. Mount Castle's Mount Castle. pretty decent. Like they've got some interesting players there. Um, so, you know, and that's not to mention the Cedric Mullins, who's really struggled for a lot of the year. So, you know, there's some interest there. Their, their record at 35 and 40, they're not going to make the playoffs this year, but that's, that's respectable in that division for the position that the Orioles are in. And they've still got reinforcements coming. I mean, Gunnar Henderson, he just got called up to AAA a few weeks ago and he's looked incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously Grayson Rodriguez, who's, who's on the shelf right now with an injury, uh, should come back later, late in the season, I believe. Um, but he has a chance to be the best pitcher in baseball, in my opinion. He looks great in the minor. He's looked great in the minor leagues. So hopefully he's able to be healthy. But he looks fantastic. So yeah, and they've got uh, I believe Kobe Mayo and yeah. uh, Colton Kowser were just called up yeah. to Double A as well. Yeah, and Heston Kierstad um, yeah. is playing his first baseball Finally in two years. Again. Yeah. So I mean, things are starting to look up for yeah. that for that Orioles farm system. Yeah. Um, and you've seen a couple of guys come up and, and reach that level for them so far, but they have a bright future. They really do. If they can just find a couple more pitchers, um, you know, long-term, because I think you see a lot of parts of their future lineup already either in the big leagues or starting to make their impacts in the minor leagues. Yeah, for sure. So who do you have? We'll move over to the pitchers now. So who do you have your pitcher this week? So uh, I picked Dylan Cease for my pitcher this week. Uh, he had two starts this week, 13 innings, a 16.6 strikeout per nine, uh, just two walks per nine. Uh, so a great week for Dylan Cease. He's a guy that's been struggling a little bit, uh, you know, as of late. He's, he's had some he's, he's had some walk issues this year, uh, up over four walks per nine. Strikeout rate's fantastic. But, uh, you know, the, the season numbers in general are really good. A 256 ERA, 251 FIP. You know, that, that efficiency has held him back a little bit. Only 81 innings and 15 starts. But uh, Dylan Cease is really good. He, his start, I believe he had a start where he, in a, a couple days ago, where he just had an absolute insanely good game. But only gave up one run in those 13 innings. He's, he's doing really well right now. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think, one of us might have picked him as Cy Young, or we had we had him as breakout at the start of the year. A, for we sure, had him a guy to watch for Cy Young. Got a, we had him as a guy to watch. We we didn't pick him for it, but we had him as a guy to watch. So um, he, um, yeah, his start against the Orioles, thirteen strikeouts, one walk, one run, on uh, you know on a home run by um, Jonathan Aruz. So um, yeah. that was the start that he made the other day. But but yeah, I mean Dylan Cease is really good and. And he's going to, I think he's going to continue to get better. There's still room for improvement there with the, with the walks that he's put up this year. Yeah. And, and you mentioned he had two starts this week and you mentioned a seven inning start against Baltimore, 13 strikeouts. But I, I even think his other start is probably more impressive. That's a six innings against Toronto, one hit, yeah, Toronto. the two walks and 11 strikeouts. Yeah. Like, so one, but two really you know, good one, ones. one less inning, three less hits, or yeah. you know, he gave it three less hits in that one inning, but two, two less strikeouts. I mean, I still think that start is just against that yeah. Toronto lineup compared to, you know, the overall lineup, the Orioles are throwing out there right now. That's yeah. a more impressive start to me, but Dylan. Yeah, of course, I, was, I was watching the game where they were placed. I was keeping up with the game. They were facing the Orioles. I wasn't really keeping up with the game. Yeah. against Toronto. So that is impressive. Both of them were, were great. His overall numbers, but they, they were. And, and, you know, his overall numbers on the season, you, you mentioned good, they're so good so far. I mean, we did have him as a breakout candidate to watch both. I think we both wanted to pick him for Cy Young. We just didn't pull the trigger on it. Um, but he's starting to take that level that we thought most people thought he could get to. Um, you know, and that trade is looking a lot worse now, even for Jose Quintana. Now, oh if he's God. taking that next level, um, you know, because Eloy hasn't, you know, really fulfilled that yet. But, um, you know, Cease is, Cease is really good, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if he starts taking that. You know, he's the upper echelon top 10 starting pitcher moving forward in the game. Yep. Um, I think that's how good he could be. But for uh, for my starter this week, I actually went with Chad Cool, um, and a lot of it is because he threw a shutout yesterday against the Dodgers in Coors Field. Um, I was th- watching a lot of that game, and I I think I turned it off in like the eighth inning or something uh, and went to sleep. But he, uh, you know, he had started to struggle over his last, the last month or so. 
Um, even against Miami in the, the second start this week in five innings, he gave it four runs. But to be able to do what he did against the lineup who, you know, they had started to hit a lot better. Um, they went into to Cincinnati, and it is against the Reds, but they scored like 29 runs in three games. They went to Atlanta, had some really tough games against them, but were able to get the offense going, you know, when it needed. Uh, and to do that in Coors Field, where it's, you know, a band box, everyone knows about what the Coors Field effect is. Um, to throw a shutout, only five strikeouts, only give up three hits in general, no walks. Um, it was just a really good start from Chad Cool, a guy who's had a really good season so far, 349 ERA, 396 FIP. The X FIP is kind of high at 458, but you know, for a cast off from the Pirates for a team that you know was looking for some starting pitching to go to the Rockies and have that start to the season so far in a place like Colorado has been, um, you know, it's been really phenomenal to see. And then for him to to do that against a, a lineup that I think most people would consider the best lineup or one of the best lineups in baseball. Um, you know, that's saying something. Yeah. I mean, Chad cool has been pretty solid um, for them and I, I don't think he's going to keep this up, but he's been, he's been a, he's been a good, you know, pretty nice surprise for, for the Rockies. Um, you know, and so they, they've been, uh, their starting pitching has actually been, their pitching in general has actually been pretty decent. Uh, this year yeah. it's had been their problem they're top 10 in war for pitchers obviously their era is kind of high but that's course i mean if you look at their fip uh 414 i mean that you know they, they've been they've been pretty good on the mound well, so. and just imagine what they'd be if herman marquez hasn't been yeah. like actually awful this year and yeah. have his fastball rate is like the worst rated fastball in mlb right now yeah so like you know it, it's definitely interesting but i think um you know, Colorado's in one of those situations where, man, they <laughs> – I don't know what to do about them. But, uh, you know, what the, the one thing that they've done, you know, they've limited the home run ball pretty well. And that's tough to do in cores. But um, but I, I don't know. I mean, they – you know, we'll see what happens with them going forward. So Yeah, I could see Chad Cool being a, uh, a guy that they flip the deadline. Yeah, they could even. maybe get him – get a you know, back into the top 30 type guy for him or something. Yeah. It's just um, – it is pretty phenomenal. Just looking at his stats right here, he has a 7.4 home run to fly ball rate this year. Yeah. 7.4%. That's, that's extremely low for yeah. being in Coors Field. Yeah, that's probably something that's going to come up too. But Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. It's been pretty interesting, but uh, we'll see how that continues going for Chad Cool. But you got anything else you want to wrap up on before we close the show out? Um, I don't think I've got too much. Uh, congrats to, to Ole Miss on winning the College World Series. Um, yep. You know, that was uh, entertaining this past week. There's, there weren't that many good games until the weekend. The weekend games were really good. So the, the final series and the Ole Miss-Arkansas series was really entertaining to watch. So I enjoyed watching some of that. And, um, but uh, pretty much, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, we'll look at, um, you know, next week I guess we'll do our breakdown because it'll be the first week of July. So – Look forward to that. And, uh, you know, All-Star game coming up. Uh, unfortunately, we'll have a week without a lot of baseball but uh, for the All-Star game. But, uh, you know, we'll see what happens here going, coming up soon. Some big series this week going on. Uh, Mets, Astros, a couple of the better teams in, in baseball. Um, that's been going. That's going on, you know, the next couple of days. Uh, Braves, Dodgers, Phillies, Padres over the, the weekend. Dodgers and Padres play this weekend. Uh, and then you got some important series between teams that are uh, Twins Guardians is a big series too. Yeah. And then you Played got five. Some, yeah. And then you got a couple important uh, Blue Jays and uh, Red Sox. And then you got a couple of important, uh, you know, games between teams like you know White Sox Angels. You know, teams that are struggling but are talented enough to where you feel like you know maybe they can turn it around a little bit. So, uh, speaking of which, the Trout and Otani just went back to back, so that was fun. But. Um, but we'll see what happens. Um, you know, it's going to be an interesting week, and I think uh, we'll have a lot to talk about with our breakdowns next week. Yeah, we'll probably do a breakdown. Uh, we'll probably mention the next phase of All Star voting because yeah. I believe that ends next week. I want to say on the first. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing we'll probably look at an, a, what our ideal home run derby field would look like yeah, since none of that's been announced so far. Um, you know, and then once that off week, we'll probably start hitting on trade deadline because that'll come quickly approaching right after yep. so do have a ton of stuff that's going to be coming in the next week 
our next couple weeks, you know, with all-star game and then heading to the trade deadline and everything. So it's going to be some packed shows, um, especially with the breakdown coming forward. So you guys will not want to miss it. So be sure to tune in on here and check out our YouTube channel uh, at the Batflip podcast. I post a version of this up there as well. Um, trying to help grow that a little bit more. So please go check that out. Like subscribe, whatever you want to do over there, just check it out. Help us grow that platform uh, somehow in some way. But thank you guys for tuning in to this episode of the Batflip Podcast, and we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks, everybody.